Good evening. Uh, thanks for coming. I know you're all fellow enthusiasts of this uh, industry we're in, which, as you know, if you've heard me before, I love it a lot. Um, notwithstanding the precariousness of, uh, of human life and of the markets, we're going to well and truly soldier on. We think the gold market has extraordinary potential, um, um, notwithstanding the high price, in, in, in my view, historically, this is a very high price, and we think the other metals um, are underpinned by fundamentals that aren't going to waver by much. We may go through these periods where, where the prices slip, but they represent um, uh, times of opportunity. We bought um, copper flat at the point at which, just after the global financial crisis, the copper price dropped to $1.80, and that was the reason we were able to acquire it. Um, so we, we believe those sorts of difficulties are going to be short-lived and that the industry is uh, very healthy in the long run. Uh, it's not that one, it's that one. Um, we're a mineral development company and we are at the moment changing from being a searcher for projects that we think are going to work to a company that believes we have two that are possibly world beaters. Uh, one of them in particular, the Westwitz uh, Panii uh, uh, Papuan, Papuan project, uh, we think could be bigger than, than anything. Um, we own 100% of the Sierra Las Minas project and we're very happy about that. That's something that we can continue to own 100% of, that we can continue to develop 100% in our own right. And it's, so that's a very important part of our strategy. We've got a 21% interest fully diluted in the MAC Resources Group. When we took this option, um, we had trouble with the AIM team, but simply because they said, well, you don't have the money to exercise the option. But it, even then, we knew we were going to corporatise it. We did that by selling it to the MAC Resources Group Limited. And fortunately, the principal of that group got a cheque last December 29th for $340 million Australian. And he has funded that project to the tune of $20 million. We put in about three. So we've got 20% of the company and we have an anti-dilution stake in the form of some warrants that are 28 cents exercise price and go for between three and five years. Very important part of our strategy. We presently own 14% of something called Panii Gold. It's an unlisted company uh, which had an asset in the Papuan province of Indonesia and it has since sold that project to a publicly listed company in Australia called West Wits. We put the whole deal together. We attracted BGF Capital, who put in uh, pre-IPOC capital into the project. They funded West Wits, <coughs> raised them $3 million, and are promoting the, the, the project and the company heavily in Australia. Uh, as you'll see from the presentation, there's lots of reasons why I think this is extra extraordinarily exciting. And some of the photos you'll see, I swear to you, I doubt whether there's a person in this room has seen mining like has been carried on in this area at the moment. Um, we also still have a 70% interest in a ACS Asia. It was bought during the time of the, fin uh, the financial crisis. It's going very well. It's running at a, a considerable profit with a full book. Um, it's likely this year, if it continues to improve in its performance, that we'll seek a buyer for it because it won't be core to our business if either Sierra Las Minas or the uh, uh, Papuan project go as well as we expect them to. Uh, Michael Silver's my chairman. He and I have been working together since the early 80s. He's developed mines that have produced over two and a half million ounces. I've been in the game since I went to university in 1970 at Melbourne. I went to Kalgoorlie in 76. The first gold I ever sold, I got $100 an ounce for. So uh, this price is a miracle for me. Um, Stephen represents the youth of our team and has done a great job since taking over from Michael de Villiers as our uh, finance, fi chief financial officer. And Luca acts as a non-executive director and he's got a tremendous banking um, uh, background and speaks very good Spanish, which also helps. Um, I'll start off with a Mac. I think some of you will know the story of it, but where it's come to is that we have been able to take it to the point where a a pre-feasibility study will be released early in the new year. We're now very confident, as you'll see from the releases, um, that the, the, the project is robust, that at these prices, and at prices considerably lower, it'll be a real engine. And Kevin uh, Maloney and, and his Tuller group have put together a team that the like of which is very difficult to find anywhere in the mining world. Um, 
the, as I say, the pre-feasibility study will come out, out sometime in the first quarter of next year, and that will be the trigger for uh, uh, fundraising in the MAC that's likely to occur at that time, and that will be a major liquidity event for our company. That's what the mine looked like when they built it in the 80s. The PEA tells us we're going to produce 36 million tonnes of copper per, per annum average for a 17-year mine life. I can tell you they expect to produce around about a half a billion dollars worth of metals in the first 24 months of operation from the high-grade core of the deposit. It's an extraordinarily tough, strong project and it, it's had the capacity to attract some very good people to it. So th that all that information will come out in the course of the next little while and we believe that going forward the project itself and the company will form the basis of a much bigger uh, company. Um, we acquired the option for $150,000. We spent about, sorry, we spent about a million and a half pounds. We, we sold it to the MAC for 14 million shares, 14 and a half million, 14.35 million now warrants. And that gives us fully diluted about 28.7 million shares. Um, along with Kevin Maloney, he owns 70% of the company, we own 20. So between us, we own 90% of the company coming out of the blocks of the feasibility study. So it's a very well-controlled register. The people who come into the project will be there because we want them to be there as much as anything else. So we believe that if we continue to hit the milestones, um, that the MAC is going to be very successful. It has to be said as well that Kevin Maloney, the chairman of the MAC, is the chairman of Altona, which is an Australian listed copper company, copper development company, also developing a mine in Finland. Um, Altona, Kevin's got 10% of Altona. It's got the Rosebury, which is the largest undeveloped copper project in Australia. Logically, uh, Kevin and I will be working towards seeing whether we can rationalise all that in the next couple of years. So there is a game plan to produce a much bigger company with copper flat as the centrepiece of that um, and, and we would like to see that company become a 100,000 ounce producer over the next several years. Um, this, this is the good part for me. Uh, Kevin went on as the chairman. As you can see, I'm not a director. All our stock is free tradable. Um, so we don't have any reason to not be able to use the MAC as liquidity for our own purposes. Ken Pickering, who came on as the board as an independent director, ran Escondida for BHP. Um, he is one of, the, one of the really, truly senior guys in the industry at the moment uh, and he brings all of that wealth of experience including working on BHP's acquisitions and disposals in North America for the last 10 years. Um, as Chief Operating Officer we managed to acquire or, or Andre decided to join us, Andre Duchesne. Andre Duchesne was the Chief Operating Officer for Franco Nevada. Um, and he's, let me tell you, he had a glowing reference from Pierre Lassonde. Um, so we have in those two guys and the rest of the team some of the best people you can get to develop a mine in North America. Um, importantly, they're also a team that can do something much bigger. Escondida is making a million dollars a day. Sorry, a million dollars an hour. 7.2 billion dollars a year. So uh, these are people who really have got the capacity to see a big picture and to drive it. And that's what Kevin's aiming for with, uh, with the map. Um, I'll next go straight into the Argentine project. The map for us is this really important thing, but it's in part a job done. I work with Kevin on the corporate structuring, but we want to see that as something that we, uh, at least in part, realise this year, because it's time, from my point of view, that shareholders started to get some of the benefit for the things we've been working on for the last two years. So that's a really important part of our strategy. Um, the, the thing that really excites us, however, is our gold, and it lives here in Sierra Las Minas, um, which I'll go into at some length in a moment. Uh, from Buenos Aires, about seven or 800 kilometres. It's due west of Troy Mining's uh, project in San Juan. It's in an area that's now very positive as far as mining goes and we have a very good relationship with the local government. Um, there had been a government there five years ago that made life hard and that's why we were able to acquire 100% of the project, which is very important to us. Wunshime is the iron ore project. I'll speak briefly about that uh, later on this evening because it's uh, uh, 
a very important, important part of some of the things we might be doing. Um, Onchime, uh, sorry, uh, Sierra Las Minas was, was a project we came across. Sierra Las Minas means the mountain of the mines. Um, we were looking at some uranium properties. We realised it was free and vacant. We realised there were a lot of old gold mines in it, so we picked it up. Uh, we pegged it, and it came about through the geologist who was working for it, working for us at the time. We have 75,000 hectares, and there's a heap of, of gold mining, uh, old, evidence of old gold mining. And you've seen some of the results, I'll show you a few in a moment, that we've been able to achieve in the, in the programs we've been running in the last six months. Enough to make us feel that there's a real opportunity here for us to go into mining in the short term, um, and if the drilling program that we've announced that will commence in the early in the new year is successful, it will be our intention to bring this into production quickly. And it's high enough grade for us to think we can do that on a toll treating basis and not have to construct a plant. Um, this is some of those assays that we've released. Can you see them there? No, you can't. Anyway, I can tell you, there's about 180 of them, 187. If you take out the 20 that go with the uh, veins that we know have uh, no gold in them, they average about, uh, uh, uncut about 13. If you cut it to 31 grams, the whole lot of them average about 10. Um, that's an extraordinary result from our point of view. The thing we need to prove now is that this stuff which is sampling at surface continues at depth. If that happens, um, then we will have literally won, won the lottery. Um, just to give you an idea of the geology, because it's a bit of fun. This is a myelinite body that's about 60 kilometres long and about 20 wide there, 15 wide there. All those yellow dots are all mine workings. And with the exception of a couple of small ones in here, they're all owned by us. The geologist who bought it to us, the whole project, owned this. We acquired it from him for a 2% royalty. It's called Elabra and it's where we've got the best results to date. And that's where we'll do our drilling. This is the structure from a Google map that you can't see, it, but if you go onto the, uh, uh, the web, you can easily pick it up. It's very obvious. And, and as I say, there are literally hundreds of these vein sets, and they're at surface, and you go and sample them, and quite seriously, those are the results we kept on getting through the whole part of the program. It's as exciting as it gets from my, so my side of my point of view, um, looking at a desert landscape, looking at something that's you know, sitting there and you're wondering why the hell it hasn't been mined, why it wasn't mined. And that's part of this Argentinian story, part of the Papuan story as well, I might add. Um, at El Abra, we've done a lot of work. It's a little difficult for you to pick this up. That's 350 metres. This is one of the vein sets through here. That, as I say, averages about 13 grams uncut. This circular structure has three high-grade hits in here, two in there, and one round the side here. So we, we have done some geophysics on it, uh, which is we completed this month, and we will start drilling in here early in January. So it's a very exciting time for uh, ECR in the sense that, that if these things carry, as I say, we will have been very successful. Um, this is the countryside. This is how they mined it out. In the old days, there's little water there, which was one of their problems. Metallurgically, it's quite complex. There's a lot of silver, a lot of copper, and we think that's the explanation. Um, the, copper is the silver is very high, runs 75, 80 grams consistently. So um, we think that's the reason the thing was never developed on a big scale. Um, but there's enough of it in this gold environment um, at, at $1,500 an ounce. You can mine this stuff if it's running 10 grams. Um, you know, you, you're really looking at four or five hundred dollar rock, which you can cart anywhere in Argentina. You can cart it to Chile if you wanted to. So it, it's uh, it's a big shot for us. Okay, I'll go from there to the other one, uh, which is more complex in terms of the structure. This is a project that we don't own a hundred percent of, and it's too risky for us to do so. So we've set Panii, Westwitz, and the Papuan project up as a project where we creep up on it over time and we've given ourselves leverage to get into the project as we go through it. Uh, sorry, I'm still getting this wrong. These nuggets... Oh, Jesus. Patrick, press the other button. These nuggets are historically mined off the tenements. These nuggets, which is about two ounces of very fine material, 
were bought by Trevor Neal, our geologist, as he did a, a tour through some of the downriver areas about a month ago. And I'm going to show you some of the photos of what, what he did. Um, the project is located in the Papuan province of Indonesia. The reason it's there is because that's where it is. Um, if it was anywhere else in the world but one of these very difficult places, it would have been worked out 80 years ago. The last one that was like this, of this scale, um, that we know of is Mount Kare. Um, and the one that was famous in Papua New Guinea was, of course, the Plaza, um, Plaza project, the, 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 the projects that became Plaza. Um, this is the project, as I say, that we um, acquired an interest in through the private company. The private company then sought funding from BGF in Sydney, um, which is now Canaccord BGF, and, and then in turn they introduced us to Westwitz. We sold the project to them and, and the, the funding has gone ahead in that, in that vein. We have a small shareholding direct in Westwitz at the moment. Uh, we have 14% in Panii and we intend to increase that through some mechanisms we have for, for doing so. Right. From the tenements that we own, about 120,000 ounces is recorded as having been produced. We think it's more like 300,000. Um, that's alluvial production. This is both an alluvial and a hard rock project, and we'll be able to explain to you why that's so exciting for us. I put these photos in for a specific reason. These are Porgra in the 60s. Porgra produced over a million ounces of gold from alluvials, and it specifically did it with wooden sluice boxes. Okay? And the reason that the wooden sluice boxes work is because the nuggets are big. Uh, most of the technology for alluvial gold now is chasing very fine gold. Um, we have a 40 hectare licence that's been granted for mining that's got about 8 or 10 million tonnes on it. And I'll show you the sort of tonnes they are. And our exploration area uh, is about 128,000 hectares. Okay. This is very important for us. Um, the placer stuff came from here and here in the old days. This 10 world-class resources, um, greater than 5 million ounces, is actually about 150 million ounces of, of resources in all these mines. Um, there's the Gold Anomaly announced the result today for one of their exploration projects. The border is in here. On the western side of the border, there's Grassberg, which is the biggest in the world. Um, it's an extraordinary thing. And Wabu, which is also part of the Grassberg tenements, that's an 8 million ounce deposit. Our little project is in there. And we can assure you the geology doesn't stop at that border. The exploration stopped and the opportunity stopped. And that's changed with the new act, Mining Act in Indonesia dramatically. Okay, there's Grassberg, a treat. 700,000 tonnes of ore a day. Um, they paid $4.5 billion worth of tax last year. That's not including the royalty. It's just a huge thing. That's Wabu, which is all part of, of uh, Freeport's project. Wabu is um, 8 million ounces, and we hear they'll never mine it. And they won't mine it because this licence runs out in 2030, and they cannot mine it all out. And I'm saying 750,000 tonne a day for 18 years and they're not going to get to the end of it. It's just, you know, literally the biggest around. Our tenements start right there and run through here for 140,000 hectares. That distance there is about 15 kilometres. So we are, we believe, in one of the most important areas geologically on the globe. This is a, a map of the information that Freeport gave us when we were granted the tenements, and from that we've developed three major sequences of anomalies, of anomalies. The closest to our mining area is this one. That's where the mining area, the alluvial mining area is. And this is our zone. And you can't see these, but it's published on, on some of the documentation. These are a, a series of um, very important anomalies, gold, copper uh, in particular, quite high grade, and all the way through the river systems that lead round to the Derawa. The highest one there was a 6,000 gram pan concentrate, 125 gram uh, rock chip. That's been mined out, and I'll show you how that happened in a little while. Um, it is really wild. These are the mountains, right? It is seriously wild. 
Um, these are the, the, the alluvial diggers who the government is removing in the process of as we speak. They're all going at Christmas time. Each one of these houses has a little shaft in it and the people crawl down the shaft and mine the gold by hand. That is a construction in the river to slow the river down so they can get in here and mine the gold out. It's extraordinary, quite extraordinary. And this is all helicopter, there's no roads in here, you can't get in here. Um, this is the way they are doing the mining. There's a sluice box, I showed you the, the big one from Octetti, that's how they're doing it. Exactly the same as we'll do with this uh, water monitoring, but in a far more sophisticated and much bigger scale. You can see the size of the rocks you've got to move. It's really a mountain country. Now this is perhaps the most interesting thing. This guy is at the end of that tunnel. That's water running out. And he's sitting there with a hose and he's hosing down the face. And when he sees a piece of gold, he picks it out. Just picks it out like that. Oh, dead serious. Oh, dead serious. There's 25 guys in a shift doing that. Um, it's just the most extraordinary thing. And that's why the government has said to them, you've got to stop because they get killed. I mean, it's just so dangerous. It's really hard to comprehend. Um, and and the, the reason this opportunity came, became available to us is that the new act, Mining Act demanded that the government get control of the whole process. But as I say, that's the process. There's the mining process and the method is hand picking. Uh, we believe that that 120,000 ounces, or however much it really is, has come out of about 10,000 tonne. The question for us is whether the, uh, whether the overburden is, contains gold on whether this stuff is all down the bottom on deep leads, as it was, say, in Victoria. What we do know is there's a hell of a lot of it, and we're hoping that it's highly economic. Um, again, this is the sort of surface that they mine down to. So you can imagine, uh, and if you know the diamond trade, that, that these are where the gold gets caught in races like that at the bottom, and these guys are washing the stuff off the top. This is the equipment we've already mobilised to site. We're in the process of putting the whole lot together. So. Um, the project itself lends itself to cheap gold production from alluvials and, and a really, really serious exploration play in what we think is probably one of the most exciting places to look for big things in the world. Um, and our tenements are secure. We're on what's called the clean and clear list in Papua, which is a very important point. Um, so we're feeling pretty good about, about exploration and development there. And we also, because of the alluvial projects um, uh, operational uh, uh, infrastructure, we can put geologists in on the, the ground very quickly. Unchi um, I won't go into it a lot. It's a very, very big iron ore deposit, probably a billion tonnes there. It's oolitic. Oolitic is different from magnetite. Sorry, I'm going it again. It's an oolitic hematite deposit. Um, these deposits were mined in the old days when boundaries really mattered. They're now not mined. They're now not mined. They're like the magnetite of 15 years ago. I don't know whether you guys can remember, but magnetite had no value. You know, you couldn't give it away. Um, my family had a dump with four million tonnes of it. Um, you know, you, quite literally, now it's worth 40 bucks a tonne. It's worth an enormous amount of money. We believe that these oolitic hematite deposits are going to be very valuable. And we're working with our partners in um, uh, Argentina to see how best we commercialise the project. And I'll say no more about it because that's an ongoing process that we'll hopefully conclude before the end of the month. Um, it, as I say, it's a, it's, it's a huge thing. And it sits here uh, in the northern part of Argentina. So in summary, um, uh, we believe that the MAC gives us financial strength. Uh, we've got liquid assets of about £7 million, pounds, um, which is the equivalent of our market cap. Um, we're very comfortable with our development program at, at, in South America for the year, and West Wits will be funded through um, that company and BGF and Canaccord. So we've got some protection from the downside and plenty of exposure to the upside. So from our point of view, we're hoping that this year, um, these things that we've worked so hard on this last year, we can start realising some into the company and giving us through um, uh, the Argentinian project and, and the Papuan project some real 
excitement as far as uh, the market is concerned.